Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where our preferred mode of communication is metaphorical and allegorical. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're listening, wherever you're listening, however you're listening. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. We've got a great conversation coming up. P.D. Newman is in the house. We'll get to him in just a moment, but first, let's do some house cleaning up front here. We've got some t-shirts in the house, and we have put them up for sale on Etsy. Etsy.com slash shop slash Podcast is the domain. It's linked in the show notes. There are a limited quantity available right now. We're just testing the water here, trying to gauge demand and popularity. The shirt is a black unisex crew neck tri-blend that features the hand-drawn sigil and text treatment that doubles as the show's logo. My man Scott Mist, a fellow Etsy store owner of Closet of Mysteries, great store, check it out. He helped me get these produced. They're screen printed by hand using eco-friendly ink and other environmentally sound practices. Honestly, this is one of the most comfortable shirts you'll ever wear, and I'm not just saying that. I met with someone to drop one off the other day, and they loved the way that it felt. The shirts are available in small through double XL, with custom orders for bigger shirts available. Just contact me. I am going to get a storefront up on the website sometime this month, hopefully. But for now, Etsy.com slash shop slash Podcast is the place to be. Of course, that's one way to support the show. Another, oculturepodcast.com slash support. Although, I am really close to launching a Patreon campaign. I just need to make a short video for it, and then it's ready. So if you're interested in donating, maybe hold off until then. And current supporters of the show, I'll grandfather you into that Patreon campaign when it's live. But I may need you guys to do something on your end first. I'll reach out to you guys about that individually here soon. But enough of that. House is clean. So let's get to the conversation with P.D. Newman. P.D. is the author of Alchemically Stoned, The Psychedelic Secret of Freemasonry. P.D. is a 32nd degree master mason in the Scottish Rite. And as it states on the back of his book, he presents a bold and daring theory that provides a radical interpretation of Masonic symbolism. And what is that theory? What is this Freemasonic psychedelic secret? Well, there's only one way to find out. So let's do it. And enjoy. P.D. Newman, it's really nice to have you here. Thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure. Uh, the pleasure's all mine, man. But I do think the first thing we need to mention is that we moved our time up a bit because you have an appointment later today with Mother Ayahuasca, and I am extremely jealous of that. Although I had lunch earlier with Mother Peverly, my biological mother, which is in its own way a spiritual experience of sorts. Um, <laughs> but back to your journey here. You're from Mississippi. Where the hell in Mississippi does one find a reputable shaman to conduct an ayahuasca session? You know, the way I feel about that is, granted, ayahuasca is its own thing that, that originates in, in the Amazon basin. So what we produce here wouldn't be ayahuasca per se. It would be ayahuasca-esque. But I, I'm a big... I, I believe in... Uh, utilizing your own resources. And uh, here in Mississippi, we have uh, a couple of plants that are ayahuasca analogs. We have, for example, passion flower, passiflora incarnata, um, grows wild here. And uh, roughly 25 grams dried does the same thing as somewhere between three and five grams of Syrian rue seeds might, as far as an MAOI. And for DMT containing plants, uh, there's a, a of a species of acacia that grows in Mississippi called Acacia farnesiana. It's pretty plentiful, um, especially down south around the coast. So I don't think you, you need a shaman. You just need a, a backyard and to know how to identify the plants and know how to prepare them, know the dosage, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, but yeah, it's available. Did you grow up down there? Uh, well, yeah, I spent my time between um, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Pennsylvania growing up. I'm from Tennessee, from Memphis. That's essentially Mississippi, right? I mean, that's that's right on the border. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, right, right. About twenty five minutes past the state line, you get into Memphis. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I spent a week in Memphis one night. Man, it was it was <laughs> it was a pretty intense experience. Uh, and we also made our way down to uh, Tunica, did some gambling at some of the casinos mm. down there. Yeah, Fun. that yeah. was. Uh, we were not identifying plants and coming up with dosages. We were essentially just drunk on alcohol, but. Um, oh, well, that's still fun. You know, you got to go <laughs> to Beale Street and sure, and uh, 
and Tunica, a lot of people don't know, but the, you know, the laws still hold here in Mississippi that to gamble, it has to be on the water, um, on a boat. So, uh, believe it or not, the casinos are, are floating on barges that are floating on, on water and these huge holes that have been dug. I don't know if you can tell going up there, it's kind of hard to tell, but all of those casinos in Tunica are floating. I did not know that. It was nighttime when we got there anyways, so I didn't really see that. That's that's cool. I didn't realize that. That's yeah, just a, a fun fun way to beat the laws, I guess. So I guess I'm wondering then, you know, like you mentioned that you have to know the plants and know the the proper dosage. When did you acquire that knowledge? Was it growing up or is it something that you've only really <clears throat> discovered recently? Well, it's in my, for one, you know, medicinal plants is in my blood. My uh, grandmother's grandfather, he was trained by either Chickasaw or Choctaw Native Americans with by their medicine men, what, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and it's There's nobody left alive in my family that knows enough information about him and what tribe he trained with. But he was the town healer. He would collect various herbs and heal livestock and children. And so I think I get it honest. And even before I was really investigating um, plant entheogens. Um, I was already studying alternative medicine. I was already fascinated with the notion of, you know, just going out in your backyard and being able to, to find something that could, you know, potentially make you feel better without having to, to spend, you know, untold amounts of money on insurance or doctor visits just to maintain health. You know, I feel like nature provides us with pretty much anything we can need. Um, for example, uh, one of the gentlemen who participated last night um, showed up a day early and was actually getting sick. And I had just, uh, you know, in building, collecting the wood for the bonfire, had located some turkey tail mushrooms, which is a great immune booster. And so we used that, made him a tea, and he drank that, went to bed and woke up, and all of the symptoms were gone. So I, r- I really feel like, you know, just using your environment. And of course, once I started getting into plant entheogens, it became a whole other story of uh, what medicine might comprise, you know, what that term could mean in different contexts. Yeah, I think that is an interesting angle to it because I don't think that, well, the average person that doesn't know anything about entheogens or psychedelics and whatever label you want to put on there, they don't realize that that is a form of medicine. They see it more of as a, as what you would call a, a drug, you know, something that you mm-hmm. could probably, and not accurately here, but probably get addicted to per se which is we know is just not that's just ridiculous but you know you mentioned growing up and this medicinal plant lifestyle has always been part of you when did that intersect with your interest in i guess freemasonic practice that came much later i I had been uh, you know exploring plant entheogens for uh, over a decade whenever i had a particularly profound experience, the theme of which was initiation, a process by which someone could become more, become something more, to be attuned to something more. And it left me with a real fascination with initiation. And after that, I started exploring the works of Alice A. Bailey was one of the early ones, um, Blavatsky, H.P. Blavatsky with the Theosophical Society. And eventually I got into things like Aleister Crowley and the Golden Dawn. And a lot of their symbolism was heavily influenced by Freemasonry. Their their ceremonies, rites of initiation, are particularly Masonic in form. And uh, the the feeling I was left with after that experience and kind of uh, exploring those topics was that you know maybe it's time to set aside entheogens for just a little while, for you know an undetermined amount of time to explore initiation in a more traditional context that might be accepted within my own culture. Because uh, I felt like I was really getting out there. I was young. I really had no frame of reference for the experiences I was having on some of these plant substances. You know, I wasn't reading much psychedelic literature. I was just mainly doing psychedelics. So I was kind of thrown off in the deep end with no real compass. And uh, that's how I ended up joining Freemasonry. I went to a uh, a local lodge and petitioned and was certain I wouldn't get in. (laughs) Just, you know, that's the feeling you get when you petition is there's no way they'll accept me. But, you know, they did. And it turned out to be one of the most gratifying, life-changing experiences. uh, Right up there with my my first psychedelic experience, right up there with the birth of my son, right up there with meeting my wife. I mean, Freemasonry turned out to be just the best thing in the world. So it, it kind of evolved organically. Yeah, and I mean, I, we should probably tell people the the reason we're chatting is because you've you've recently published a book 
I guess it was back in the summertime, really, but you've recently published a book. It's called Alchemically Stoned, The Psychedelic Secret of Freemasonry. So we've already touched on, you know, a little bit of your background with psychedelics, a little bit of your background in Freemasonry. But the major premise of your book, I mean, the back cover, I think, <laughs> of it says it all. It is You claim to have a, a bold and daring theory relating to Masonic symbolism. And you really do take aim at reconstructing some uh, common misconceptions and uh, misinterpretations of the symbols and customs of, of not just masonry, but of many mystery schools. And that really does, like I said, it makes up the general foundation of your book here and uh, what will mm-hmm. lay the foundation here for the rest of our chat as well. So let's start with, as it relates to the book, just a, a general sort of thesis statement or maybe an abstract of sorts. What is the theory that you put forth here? Well, in Freemasonry, there is an important symbol that shows up in the Master Mason degree. That's the sprig of acacia. And the way we experience it in Masonry today is just that, it's a symbol. But, you know, coming into Masonry, uh, I already knew of Acacia as a potent source of dimethyltryptamine. So my ears automatically perked up when I, I experienced this in the ritual. And, you know, it was nothing more than kind of a, a fun coincidence until I started looking into the history of the Master Mason degree, where there was no mention of Acacia. Instead, it was a mention of something called Cassia, which is Cassia is like cinnamon. And um, its origin is in uh, China, whereas uh, Acacia, there are some species of Acacia that are actually found in Jerusalem, which is important because Masonic symbolism comes from the Old Testament. So it would need to be something native to Jerusalem anyway to even make sense. But somewhere between 1730s and 1745, Cassia all of a sudden became Acacia across the board. Every lodge in, in England changed to Acacia, and no one knows who was responsible for that change. It's, it's a complete mystery. So that, that got me thinking, well, why would it be so important to change it, and why is there no record of it? So that's where the search began, and it eventually led me to explore every ritual I could get my hands on, different Masonic rituals, which finally led to me led me to uh, uh, a gold mine, a fellow named Cagliostro, who was an uh, Italian mystic that created a Masonic rite called the that he called the Egyptian rite of Freemasonry, and in it he had his candidates actually drinking a concoction of acacia, and this was the first time that I had encountered it as anything other than just a symbol. You don't drink symbols; you drink libations, and they, here they are drinking a libation of acacia. So the real thesis of the book is that there's a good chance we know that that Acacia was being used in an entheogenic context by Cagliostro. The language of the ritual specifically points to entheogenic experience, to a mystical kind of experience, as well as a, another Freemason named Melissino, which we'll get into, I'm sure, here in a little bit. But um, as far as the thesis goes, because we know that certain Freemasons were using Acacia in an entheogenic Indigenous context. It may explain why the change was made in the first place from Cassia to Acacia. And of course, that, that comes with a lot of controversy and disbelief because most Masons completely, especially the, what we call the old guard, or the old guys, they just can't wrap their mind around the fact that a drug may have played a role in, in early Freemasonry. But, you know, it's important to keep in mind that the era in question is the 18th century when drug abuse wasn't really a problem. You know, there as drugs, drug abuse as we know it today didn't exist. There was no word for entheogens or psychedelics. So anything that would have induced that kind of numinous experience, uh, I believe, would have been met with such novelty that it's no wonder that, you know, complete Masonic lectures and rituals and even rites were, were dedicated to it in and around 1762. There also wasn't the modern pharmaceutical industry, which really, if you trace it back, does go back to this practice of alchemy. I've been reading a lot about Cagliostro recently. I'm glad you brought him up because I've been also reading a lot about the uh, Knights of Malta, who Mm -hmm. look to be central players in the creating the what we know as modern pharmaceuticals, you know, from alchemical practices, too. So, right, right. um, I think we should probably make it known that when we're talking about drugs, we're really just talking about plants here. We're talking about fungi. These are things that are just naturally occurring here on Earth. These are not drugs like we think of a, a tablet of Tylenol, you know, something mm-hmm. like that. This is These are plants and fungi that, that have been around much, I think, probably much longer than, than we have, too. So, But going back to Cagliostro, he's an interesting character. And going back to your mention of Cassia, 
which is uh, similar to cinnamon, I did hear a while ago cinnamon and also nutmeg in a proper dose could produce a psychedelic experience. Have you heard that? I have with, with nutmeg. I didn't know that cinnamon or cassia could, but nutmeg certainly. It has a an entheogenic compound in it that, you know, Cagliostro even made use of. There's a, a recipe that um, the author Chris Bennett dug up and shared with me that's called Elixir de Cagliostro, and it calls for a liter of, of uh, liquor, of 80-proof liquor, to be infused with just incredible amounts of, of nutmeg, Saffron, which has its own antigenic properties. Saffron is one source for MDMA precursors. So yeah, there, there's a definite chance. I, I wasn't aware of the, um, the cinnamon or cassia, but I, I wouldn't doubt it at, at certain doses. And I, I'm not sure what compound in it would cause the effect, but we certainly know that nutmeg is uh, capable of it. Yeah, and uh, tis the season for nutmeg flavored everything. So uh, <laughs> right. maybe if yeah, if you're interested in having a a nice legal trip, maybe look up how to create some psychedelic nutmeg recipe, and please do share it with us. There's precedent for it. You know, William S. Burroughs talked about sailors taking nutmeg, you know, getting trashed at sea, and you know, Charlie Parker, the famous jazz saxophonist, he liked to put a big heaping tablespoon of nutmeg in his Coca Cola and drink it down before a show. It's been pretty widely known, you know, among the, the counterculture types, but it's it's kind of escaped the attention of, of the rest of the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, going back to the mention of acacia and DMT, you know, this this is something that actually pops up in stories from different cultures and mystery schools besides masonry. Could you give us some examples of where acacia is found in these cultures and, and how it's portrayed? Well, sure. You know, acacia first of all, is is a prominent tree mentioned in, in the Old Testament. It's, it was allegedly what the Ark of the Covenant was constructed from. Um, it's what was what's referred to as shittim wood in the Old Testament. It's also, play, it plays a role in Egyptian mythology, where Osiris is said to have been encased in the acacia tree, which I think is pretty significant. There's uh, Albert Pike in his Morals and Dogma, he names a number of, of early sources, including an early Islamic idol that was destroyed by Muhammad, pre-Islamic idol, uh, that was constructed of acacia. And he also mentions that some scholars back in his day even said that the cross of Christ was constructed of acacia. So it's got a pretty heavy prevalent presence in a lot of different traditions that are associated with what we might call mysteries. It's even used as an incense, uh, as a foodstuff, the, what we call Arabic gum or gum Arabic, uh, acacia gum. It's used as a foodstuff in some cultures. It's used as a binding agent. It's even used as a different species of acacia and different brews by uh, different tribes, groups. I name a number of them in my book, but some of the, some of the specifics escapes me. Uh, I like I, I can remember one Bauche, uh, a brew called Bauche that I believe originates in, in Africa. And then there's um, a smoke, a medicinal smoke in Australia that's created from the leaves of several different species of acacia. Australia being, you know, kind of the most acacia-rich place in the world. So there, there's a number of them. Well, tell us a little bit too about the history of acacia specifically as it relates to Masonic texts and Masonic allegories, because it does play a role in the story of Hiram Abiff, too. Mm-hmm. And the, the exact presence of the symbol in Freemasonry, the, the story, it's an allegory, allegorical story, that's kind of written around a figure that's found in the Old Testament. Um, but Hiram Abiff is his name. He was, in the Old Testament, he was the, the master of works at King Solomon's Temple. And in Freemasonry, he's one of the three grand masters, the other two being Hiram, King of Tyre, and King Solomon. And, the, you know, in Masonry, there's a, a prevalence of uh, mystic words, and the three were in possession of this word that could only be spoken when they were all together, and that's the, the lost word of Freemasonry, the master's word. The reason it's lost is uh, like I said, they have to be all three of them together to pronounce it in the in the allegory. And Hiram, after coming down from working on his architectural plans for the temple, is met by three fellows of the craft, three Freemasons, who are of lesser rank, and they want the the word 
from him so that they can get the higher rank. Because part of the the symbols, the way the symbols operate, each each degree of Freemasonry is possessed of a certain of a certain word that gives them access to uh, a mason's wages, and you know the having the right word gets you more wages, which uh, of course has its own symbolic import. But he's accosted by these three fellow crafts who want the word, and he refuses to give it to them. So they murder him and hide his body. And they they want to bury it proper uh, because they're met with guilt afterwards where they realize what they've done. So they hide it, his body in a rubbish heap, and they plan to come back and dig it back up and give it a proper burial. I think that's the implication of the allegory. And so that they can find it again, they plant a sprig of acacia at the head of the grave. And uh, it's that sprig of acacia that leads the rest of the fellow crafts to discover his remains when they go searching for him. And as it says in the uh, Rite of Strict Observance, in their, their ritual, it says that they saw the sprig of acacia, they grabbed a hold of it to try and climb up on top of this rubbish hill, and it came loose. And it says that they noticed that it had no root, and from this, they knew it must signify something. I always thought that was significant, because, of course, it's in the roots where dimethyltryptamine is found within most species of acacia. But that's the allegory, how it shows up. And like I said, it's just presented as a symbol. But uh, it seems, you know, the more you look at it from different angles, it seems that uh, there's definitely more implied by that symbol. Yeah, definitely. And I think we may be able to shine some light here on where that symbolism in Masonic tradition came from. And talk to us a little bit about the Sufis, because this is a, this is a group that I personally haven't been able to dig much into yet, but... Uh, you mentioned in your book that they're known as the Eastern parents of Freemasons, and it, it seems like they did have a lot of psychedelic rituals and traditions that may have been passed on. Mm-hmm. They, they still do to this day. Um, they're one in the region currently used by a number of Sufi orders, including the Naqshbandi Sufis as the Syrian Ru or Peganum Harmala, which is uh, a powerful monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And it's, of course, it's MAOI, the monoamine oxidase inhibitor, that renders DMT orally active. Usually it's not orally active. So we do know that they're possessed of that and that they use it. Uh, it's said that Muhammad had consumed these seeds whenever he uh, received the Quran. And there's Mike Crowley. Uh, I spent some time with him not long ago in Northern California, and he told me about uh, a Sufi friend of his that had reported that they make flutes from these special reeds and that the reeds themselves are magic. And Mike's asked the guy, you know, well, the music's magic? You, so you're talking about using the music in a magical context? He said, no, the reeds, the flutes themselves are magic. And after he, you know, inquired about the particular species of this reed, Mike said, oh, well, I already know that contains large amounts of dimethyltryptamine. And that's kind of where the conversation ended. So there's even a high possibility that some Sufi orders may be using this ayahuasca-esque thing, just like we do here with the passion flower in the case of Farnesiano. And there's even a current, a, a current Sufi order that's recently been established. I, the name escapes me, but he, the founder, has actually built it up around ayahuasca. It's their central sacrament that they use to. To, what's the word I want? The, the word the, to, um, not to divine, but to, we'll just say to experience the numinous, to, to go into um, the trance necessary to experience something of the other. And, and as far as it being the Eastern parent of Freemasonry, uh, that's been suggested by a couple of scholars. There's no real evidence that it is, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a, a school of thought that definitely believes that Sufism is the, the Eastern parent of Freemasonry. And there certainly are a number of practices that look similar when when compared, so, so that's possible. Yeah, and, and just so we're clear here, for people that may not know what Sufism is or who the Sufis are, this is an Islamic sect, right? That's right, a mystical sect of Islam. Uh, most people are probably familiar with the poet Rumi or Hafiz. These guys were Sufis. There's a huge tradition of poetry among the Sufis because it's an, it's an ecstatic religion, so there's lots of place for love poems and love poems to deity and to the nature and to self and just a complete mystical inclination towards art, music, dance especially. You'll see some Sufi sects are known as the whirling dervishes and it's the spinning holy men that will spin and spin and spin until they leave the body essentially. So yeah, mystical Islam. 
mystical application of the Quran. Do you think that they spin so much? Because, like, could that induce a DMT dump somehow? Well, I don't know. You know, we there is endogenous DMT. The the big question is how to get it to secrete on its own, or how to do do something. You know, and there's lots of speculation that you know, long long nights of dancing, yoga, certain ceremonial magic practices, breathing techniques. There's been some speculation that these things may induce it alongside with, like Rick Strassman says in his book, trauma, childbirth, brushes with death, you know, uh, extreme terror, things like that could could induce it. But but as far as spinning the whirling dervishes being a means of of inducing DNT, it's a you know it's it's wide open. I don't I really don't know. But like I said, we do know that there's there is a, a biomechanical means for producing DMT. If that's one of them, I couldn't say one way or the other. Well, as someone who personally loves to dance, I actually love moving in that fashion, and it does give you a little bit of a high, you know, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've I've never Mm -hmm. really... Never really had what I would consider a, a DMT trip while I was dancing or, or because of dancing. But damn it, I would love to try it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you yeah. know, some cultures do. They dance for days at a time. And what's called men's work, a mythopoetic tradition of like men working with other men in an initiatory and elderly kind of context. Um, one of the things they say is, you know, dance till you break through. You know, dancing is a big part of it. Just so many people are afraid to dance. Uh, and I think just the act of opening up and dancing does something good for the soul. But, you know, it seems like prolonged dancing definitely produces a, another effect that seems to, to verge on the, the otherworldly. And uh, anybody who grew up in, in the uh, the rave culture of the late 80s, 90s, you know, there's plenty of tales you hear about people who dance all night long and collapse and end up having these kind of mystical experiences even without the use of LSD or MDMA. It's definitely a phenomenon. Dancing too is, it's one of the oldest ritual practices that we have as a species, you know, and when you combine Mm -hmm. it with music, I mean, specifically, I'm sure you can dance without music, but most people probably wouldn't think to. When you combine it with music, which to me is one of the highest forms of magic, if not the highest, Mm -hmm. you have the ritual setting right there Mm -hmm. to experience something really divine. Right. And that's an integral part of a lot of cultures. You look at Vudan and Haiti, you know, whenever these devotees become a, a follower of a specific, a specific deity, one of the things they look for is the steps. There are certain steps that go with each deity that uh, the elders are looking to see, does she have the steps? And, you know, if you have the steps, then it's a lot more probable that, that you, you have the potential to be ridden, as they say, by, by a specific deity. So, and the same thing in rites of passage for, uh, for pubescent males in certain tribal scenarios. You know, the, the entire mythology and history of a specific tribe is sometimes communicated by dance alone. No words, just, just by dance. So it's, it's pretty incredible the amount of information and the effects that can come just from dancing. I, I'm right on board with that. Yeah, dancing is uh, the original body language, I guess I would call that. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned the Egyptian ride of Cagliostro earlier. You also name-dropped Melisino. People might not know either of these guys, and we don't have to give bios of them. You did sort of describe Cagliostro and how he created this new rite of Freemasonry, and Melisino mm-hmm. did the same thing. He created this thing called the Russian Rite. Tell us a bit about Melisino's Russian Rite and how it is similar to Cagliostro's Egyptian Rite. Melisino, he's widely considered the greatest Russian artillery man of his time. He created, like you said, the the Russian Rite of Melisino, as it's known. He was a contemporary of Cagliostro. They were known friends. Both of them were practicing alchemists, uh, which is a, a key point because the means by which DMT was produced by these guys was an alchemical technique. It wasn't just boiled up acacia, as we'll, we'll learn here with Melisino. So as early as 1762, Melisino established his right, and in it, I believe it's the seventh degree, which, unlike any other Masonic right, it has to take place in a church, uh, because he saw it as a, a holy thing. And... In it, he specifically says, and Cagliostro uses this exact same language, and I suspect Cagliostro got it from Melisino, but that's speculation. So the specific language is that it's an alchemical language where they say that 
uh, well, first of all, the alchemists were preoccupied with something called the Philosopher's Stone, producing the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone was a mystical substance that was created from another secretive, secret substance that they never named called the prima materia, or first matter. So both Cagliostro and Melusina say that the acacia with which you were provided in the degree of Master Mason is nothing other than the prima materia, than the first matter. And they say that Melusina says, from this first matter is produced uh, the Philosopher's Stone, and that this stone is identical to the stone in the book of Isaiah. So to, he doesn't. He says identical to the burning coal in the book of Isaiah. So when you break out the, an Old Testament and you start looking at Isaiah, what happens is an angel places a burning coal to his lips, and he is immediately given a vision. And any time, uh, I know when I place a burning coal to my lips, it's because I'm smoking something, which is uh, the only practical application of placing a burning coal to your lips. So he's saying, essentially, that a stone that was produced from a plant can be uh, incinerated and produce a vision. And, you know, you say, well, what is the stone? I mean, we're talking about elixir. Well, when you produce DMT, it, it's a crystalline substance. It's, it's technically a salt. So in, in pre-chemistry days, this would have been viewed as a stone, a purified DMT crystal would have been a stone, literally, quite literally, a vegetable stone produced from a plant. And another thing that caught my eye was, you know, in masonry they say that the meaning of acacia, uh, according to its Greek etymology, is freedom from sin or innocence. And the the very thing that the angel says when he places the coal to Isaiah's lips is, thine iniquity has been purged, meaning you are now free from sin. So it's almost like he's placing the coal to his lips and saying acacia. Which, you know, makes you wonder just how far back this tradition might go. Because, of course, Melusino and Cagliostro both believed they were perpetuating, perpetuating a, an ancient mystery that dealt directly with Christ, with Adam. You know, Cagliostro specifically says that this acacia was the plant in Eden that Adam, because of his transgression, lost access to. But he says to his candidate that it still exists in the elect of God, the elect, in the hands of the elect of God, uh, meaning himself, you know, the initiates of this rite, meaning they had the secret of this plant. So that's really who, who Melusina was. I had been writing my manuscript and had already discovered the Cagliostro bit and had no idea who Melusina was at the time, but the man who wrote my blurb that you brought up earlier, Arturo de Hoyos, he was in the process of translating the rite of Melusina for a Masonic rite called the Grand College Rite. And once he translated that portion, he immediately contacted me and he said, look, I, I think you're onto something. You know, I think this might pertain to the same thing that you're describing from Cagliostro and uh, basically encouraged me to include it in the manuscript, which I'm eternally grateful for. He, so I have to credit him with, with discovering the significance of that particular part of my book. But yeah, Melusino was like I said, hugely important in this regard because, you know, like Cagliostro, he, he's providing the, the key that says, yes, some masons were fully aware of entheogenic properties of these of this acacia. So again, it might explain why acacia became acacia in the first place. Because the, one of the persons who I suspect may be responsible for it is a man named De Fagulier, who was the third grand master of the uh, Premier Grand Lodge of England. And he was a practicing alchemist, uh, so much so that he was actually the research assistant to Sir Isaac Newton and the Royal Society, who we know from uh, recent discoveries, uh, Sir Isaac Newton was a practicing alchemist. We actually have instructions for producing the Philosopher's Stone written in, uh, it's something he took from an alchemist named Starkey, uh, but it's written in Newton's own hand in uh, typical alchemical language. So... Like I said, I suspect that he may be responsible for it ultimately for the change, but it wasn't until Cagliostro and Melusino came along that we have even the possibility that this kind of thing was known. Yeah, Melusino was a, a new character for me to discover as well through your work. And just the idea that the prima materia of alchemy could be just DMT salt crystals blew my mind. And you're the first person that I've read that from. So, you know, thanks for the info, man. Like, that's that's actually really cool. 
And it, it does sort of make, make alchemy seem like it's not this really complex process that it's always made out to be, that it's really just much simpler than that. Mm-hmm. Um, That's, alchemy was really a DIY process. You know, different alchemists had different approaches, and they're all working with this mystical language. So it was largely up to them to find these substances, identify them, and figure out how to produce the desired effect. And some alchemists got lucky and said, well, you know, like, I think this part, this particular thing may be the answer. And some didn't get lucky and they'd say, well, I think there's no answer. I think what we're talking about is a spiritual transmutation. And I think all of that's valid, but it appears to be in Freemasonry where we just see a direct indication that a KCI DMT solution may be unique to Freemasonry. Just these, like I said, Melatino, Cagliostro, uh, maybe a couple of other select groups, but you know, it seems it almost seems like when you really get into alchemical literature, they all seem to have a different answer, a different solution to the problem. And uh, this this just may be unique to Freemasonry. Well, regardless, you know, it's an answer that resonates. When I read through your book, it was like you know, like I just said, it, it makes a lot of sense that it's something that essentially has been here with us all along. You know, like we mentioned, it, we endogenously produce DMT. Uh, you know, there's many different theories on how and, and where in our bodies that that gets produced, but I think it's safe to say that, that it's it's been here with us all along. So I wanted to transition just a little bit. You know, you also mention ergot in the book and the role that it plays in initiations and its connection to kaikion. Am I saying that right? Uh, uh, kaikion, kaikion, mm-hmm, both are acceptable. I mean, it's just a... It's going to be a, depending on dialect, but I think uh, I think both are. Keek, I've heard Kikion. I know what you're talking about. All right, good, good. Ergot, its connection to Kikion, Kikion, and the uh, the Greek Eleusinian mysteries. The ergot alkaloids do have psychoactive properties, and and they do contain lysergic acid. You know, that's uh, a precursor for the synthesis of LSD. But as it relates to our conversation here, ergot seems to have a connection to King Solomon's temple, which, uh, as we know, is an important symbol in Freemasonry. This was a new connection to me. What was that? Well, King Solomon's temple and the interdependence degree were told that it, it was an exact replica of the tabernacle, except for being more grandiose. King Solomon's Temple, well, for one, it, it was constructed on a threshing floor. And a threshing floor is where grains are collected, smashed open, and then thrown into the air, and the wind blows away the chaff, and the grain falls back down to the floor. And at the Eleusinian Mysteries, if you read Wasson, Ruck, and uh, Hawson's book, The Road to Eleusis, um, they provide a solution for how thousands of initiates at a time were able to have this profound mystical experience all on cue, all at the same time. I I don't care what ritual or scenario you provide, you know, there's no other way than uh, a drug, in my opinion, to and in their opinion also, to get a collective response like that. And so, you know, after analyzing uh, Greek pottery that depicted the Eleusinian Mysteries, and the, uh, analyzing the ritual itself, the, the grounds where it took place. They concluded that the Rarian Plain, which is a, a huge plain of barley that was adjacent to uh, where the Eleusinian Mysteries took place, that what quite probably happened was that they were collecting ergot kernels from this barley, and uh, give, that's what was going into the Kikion beverage, the brew that all of the initiates were given prior to their illumination. And when you read the experiences from the various philosophers like Pendar and Proclus, who went through the Eleusinian Mysteries, you know, they describe tremors, sweating, euphoria, terror, visions of gods, you know, things that are perfectly in line with what you would expect from an entheogenic experience. And the recipe that's given, I believe it's in uh, the hymn to Demeter, the recipe that's provided for the Kikion, it just says, Barley groats, water, and pennyroyal mint leaves. And of course, barley itself isn't uh, entheogenic. Pennyroyal mint leaves aren't either. Maybe slightly so due to thuhone content, but but not psychoactive really. And so that, the the solution that it wasn't just barley groats, that it was something that grew on barley, really gave some headway. And you know, when they like I said, when they compared this to the pottery, lots of the pottery showed these 
grains of barley that clearly had dark, extending grain sticking out of it, which is what ergot looks like growing out of the barley. So now back to the threshing floor, as Carl Ruck talks about in his book, I think it's called The Secrets of Eleusis, Sacred Mushrooms of the Goddess. He mentions that there was also a threshing floor at Eleusis, where they would ceremonially collect up the ergot kernels. This was called Triptolemus' threshing floor. Triptolemus symbolically presided over this particular rite. And Triptolemus is a, uh, a deity. It's not a person. Like a priest may have played the role of Triptolemus, but Triptolemus itself is, is like Bacchus or Demeter. It's a, a divinity of sorts. It was at this threshing floor. So, you know, going back to the threshing floor at in Masonry, so King Solomon's Temple is erected on a threshing floor. And that doesn't say much, but whenever you compare it to the fact that we're told that it's a direct reproduction of the tabernacle, you get some answers. And the answers come from uh, a man named Dan Merker, who wrote a book called The Mystery of Manna, The Psychedelic Sacrament of the Bible. And in it, he discusses this episode in the Book of Numbers that he calls the drought ordeal. And this woman, who is accused of adultery, is brought into the tabernacle, and they take cereal dust from the floor. So we're basically talking about uh, what's left over on a threshing floor, cereal dust. And she takes this, he puts it into a glass of water, the priest does, and she tells her, she denies that she's adulterous. And the priest says, well, if you're telling the truth, then, you know, you'll be fine. But if you're lying to us, then this drought you're about to drink uh, will cause your thigh to fall off, will cause your belly to swell, and other just totally grotesque symptoms, all of which are perfectly in line with ergot poisoning. So he makes a great argument all the way around for the, the potential use of ergot-infested cereal grains in the Old Testament. But he basically argues that this dust was ergot-infested cereal dust, just like the threshing floor that Solomon's temple would have been built on. Because like we said, Solomon's temple, in every respect, was a reproduction of the tabernacle. So the tabernacle if that's true, it must have also been constructed on a threshing floor. And that's also Dan Merker's conclusion. Speaking of ergot poisoning, there are toxic compounds in ergot and there are psychoactive compounds in ergot. The psychoactive ones are water-soluble. The toxic ones are not. So how does this woman in numbers get ergot poisoning where thousands of people experience an entheogenic trip at Eleusis? Well, that's, the, that's it. It's that it's water-soluble. So if you did a simple water extraction with the ergot, then what you're left with is a powerful psychoactive brew that's comparable to LSD, LSA trip. Whereas if you just put the dust in their hole and drink the grains along with the water, you're basically facing potential ergot poisoning. So, you know, all this would be really theoretical, except for we are exposed to a certain, I can't say the word, of course, because of my obligation, but that we're given a word, a password, as fellow crafts. And the meaning of that word, as Albert Pike says, every Masonic word has a hidden meaning. Uh, well, the meaning of that word has pretty much escaped scholars, Masonic and non-Masonic alike, for a long time, until a book came out called... Um, uh, it was Robert Hewitt Brown was the author. Uh, the title escapes me, but it has, I think it's astrotheology, maybe. But in it, he says that this particular word comes from the Eleusinian Mysteries, and it, it's an allusion to the Eleusinian Mysteries. So that that's what cued me off and made me say, well, you know, uh, let me look at this deeper. And the word that's given translates in masonry to two things. And masonry, you're usually given one explanation for something. So for the translation to be given as two different things, already is, is pretty curious. And the two, the two translations are an ear of wheat or a, a shaft of wheat and a waterfall. So when we talked about the basic water extraction that would produce the entheogenic brew without the toxic side effects, the composite meaning of those two things, of an ear of wheat and a waterfall combined, is suggestive, was suggestive to me at least, of what, what in modern coffee house parlance is called a, a pour-over. A water extraction filtered out filters out the the plant matter itself, and I need to add that I you know while I do think that there were masons doing DMT, maybe a large number of them, I do not think um, that masons were doing ergot. I just I don't think that was that's feasible. What I really think is going on here is that, like Merker said, it, it may have been going on in the Old Testament, and we of course draw much of our symbolism from the Old Testament. But on top of that, masonry is kind of an amalgamation of mystery schools. It draws its symbolism and language from a number of sources. Mithraism, the Eleusinian mysteries, 
et cetera. So I think in borrowing some of this terminology and symbolism and alchemy, um, other schools, because these schools were dealing directly with entheogenic compounds, entheogenic substances and use, even though that meaning was lost, because masonry borrowed from them, borrowed the symbols, Masonic symbolism therefore inadvertently points to entheogenic experience and entheogenic symbol. So I think it was just, a, you know, might have been by accident, might not have, but paired with Ruck's research, uh, Merker's research, it just starts to look interesting from a whole new perspective. Definitely. And thank you so much for sharing all that with us. And, you know, you mentioned Mithras or Mithras earlier, and I, I wanted to, to wrap up here on a few points. You know, I mentioned in my description of the book at the beginning of our conversation that you had sort of reconstructed some common misconceptions and misinterpretations of symbols throughout some mystery schools. And I wanted to wrap up here by looking at some of these symbols and some of these ideas or concepts and allowing you to sort of set the record a little straighter, perhaps. And you mentioned Mithras and Mithras, and we'll get to that. I do want to talk about that idea. But I think the first one I want to talk about is Baphomet or Baphomet. This okay. is one of the most misunderstood concepts in all of occultism and esotericism. Baphomet right, does, right. does not seem to be this dark, almost satanic deity as many like to claim. But instead, in your book, you claim it's something else entirely. And it's something that's connected to the Knights Templar, to severed heads and the stories of the Holy Grail, the Golden Fleece, the Golden Apple. So mm -hmm. what is Baphomet and where does that term come from? Well, I'm glad you asked that. This is a topic that actually came up last night um, on the tail end of our ayahuasca session. The depiction of Baphomet as the goat-headed, hermaphroditic, kind of traditionally devil on the tarot card appearance came from a drawing by Eliphaz Levy, who was hugely influential occultist and magician. But it also, that depiction, because of a man named Leo Taxel, who was trying to prove that Freemasons were Satanists, he took that image and ran with it. And he later, of course, admitted that it was all a hoax. But that made made a mark. Baphomet and its potential association with Freemasonry kind of took hold. But Baphomet, before Levy made his famous drawing, the word first came about during the Templar persecutions. And of course, the Templars were rounded up by the Pope and King Philip and were tortured and um, interrogated. And during these interrogations, they admitted to revering something called Baphomet. It was kind of just right off the bat interpreted as some kind of deity. So they said, well, what is Baphomet? You know, in, in the later confession, Baphomet, they said, was a severed head. So, you know, we're, we're not really looking at a goat figure. That's just really what these interpretation. So the Knights Templar are constantly kind of grouped together with the Knights of the Holy Grail. Even if you look at Wolfram von Eschenbach, one of the early Grail romancers, if you look at his writings, he specifically says that the Grail Knights were Knights Templar. So there's this association of the Knights Templar being in possession of the Holy Grail. And, you know, there's been plenty of books written around this, uh, the Templar Revelation, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, etc., well, the only thing they confessed to being in possession of was a severed head. So how do you how do you rectify a grail with a head? Well, it's in the name itself. As Von Hammer, who was really an anti-Templar character, he argued that Baphomet was a combination of two Greek words, Baphe Matisse, which means the baptism of wisdom. And I, I think that's probably the best interpretation of what's going on, mainly because, uh, you know, the other interpretations are uh, that Baphomet is a, an amalgamation of different words like Sophia and Muhammad, which is possible given the Gnostic inclinations and the fact that the Templars may have had some kind of connection with the assassins outside of them being diametrical opposites against one another. But the Baphometis thing really stuck with me because I had just recently read in the Corpus Hermeticum where it talks about how deity sent down a cup of mind, a cup of wisdom to man so that man might baptize, baptize himself in this libation. So you're automatically kind of faced with, well, it's a cup, but they're supposed to baptize themselves with it. Well, you drink from cups. So, you know, whether they're drinking from it or pouring it over their head, there's still this association with this cup. And uh, later, when I actually went through the Masonic degrees and decided to go through what's called the Ancient Accepted Scottish Rite, as well as in the York Rite, there are two rituals, one in each, that pertain to the Templars. And the culmination of these rituals is the drinking 
of wine from an actual human skull, uh, from the, the cap of the skull that's, you know, uh, inverted, filled with wine, and, and you drink it. And, you know, sitting there at the altar and with the candles flickering, you know, looking at the skull cup and during my initiation, I was immediately struck with the resolution that here I am looking at both a grail, a cup, and a severed head. And not to mention the association of drinking a libation with this idea of baptism, baptism of wisdom, a cup of mind, as they said in the Hermetic text. Immediately struck with, you know, just the, what I saw as this unmistakable uh, resolution to this, this puzzle of what is Baphomet. So that question being answered, then the, the next question that immediately follows, logically follows, is what was in the cup originally? And what brought about an answer to that was my exposure to this chronographer named John Malalas, who was discussing an ancient Greek myth of the story of Perseus and Medusa. And what he says is that Perseus, after defeating the Medusa, went on to found Medea. Well, Medea is where the the Magi, the Magi post-Zoroastrian Magi religion was formed, and uh, the same same of which use paganum homola seeds, which is an ingredient in ayahuasca, I might add, to this day as uh, a holy plant. Well, he says that when he entered Medea, what was to become Medea, that he used the skull cap of Medusa's skull of her head as a cup, and he taught the citizens the rites of Halma with the skull, with the skull cup. So Halma is the Middle Eastern equivalent of the Far Eastern Soma, and in the Far East, Soma, Amrita, they're synonymous terms. The Vajrayana Buddhists, uh, the Agoris, they drink Soma, Amrita, from a skull cup, and they call them Kapalas. So I was immediately just stuck, struck with, um, again, this remarkable consistency pertaining to Baphomet, the real meaning of Baphomet, what the Templars were doing, potentially doing. It, it's closest to the mark than anything, any other explanation I've found. And of course, there's a lot of controversy as to what Soma actually was. Uh, you know, Gordon Lawson argued that Soma was um, Amanita muscaria mushrooms, what's called fly agaric mushroom, the famous fairy tale red mushroom with white spots. But then, you know, you have Chris Bennett, on the other hand, who argues that it was cannabis. And of course, you know, Soma existed through such vast epoch time that, you know, I'm of the opinion that it could have been both, depending on the time, the location, you know, due to climate change, what was available at the time that different things could have answered the Soma at different epochs. Because like I said, even with the Halma and the Zoroastrian religion, it's become pagan and Harmala seeds. And if you look at Soma now and the Hindu religion among the Brahmins, it's become something called Asclepius Akita or Asida, which has no psychotropic value whatsoever. It's just a bitter plant. But we, we naturally see this changing from one substance, one substance to another over time. So yeah, that's how, you know, Baphomet kind of ties up with my own research into entheogens because it's a it's a ritual, a baptism of wisdom that somehow takes place with something that's both a grail and a skull that I, I really think the only solution to is the kapala, that skull cup, and what was drunk from it. Yeah, man, that blew my mind. That's so fascinating. And you just mentioned, too, uh, the Zoroastrians and the Hindus as well. And we mentioned Mithras a few minutes ago, too. The concept of Mithras does appear both in Zoroastrianism and the Hindu Vedas. But Mm -hmm. the interpretation of that is slightly different than the interpretation that you find later with the Roman cult of Mithras. So could you set that record straight? Tell us what is Mithras exactly and how does it relate back to your thesis here? Well, in Zoroastrianism and in Hinduism, Mitra, or Mitra, as it shows up without the added H, is a mediator. He's a deity that comes between God and man, the highest God, which, of course, in Hinduism would be Brahman, and Zoroastrianism would be uh, Ahura Mazda, or Muz, it's also translated as or Muz, but Ahura Mazda. So yeah, Mitra is known by different epithets, like friend of man, uh, shepherd of men, you know, a lot of dis- a lot of titles that were transferred on to Christ and Christianity, uh, because you know Christianity came after and was greatly influenced by the cult of Mithras in Rome. And the way it became a Roman cult was it's suspected that the Roman soldiers during their travels encountered certain Mithraic rites in the middle and possibly far east and transferred them back. Um, and because it wasn't 
you know, a pure manifestation of, of Mitra worship in either one of those cultures, it naturally, you know, acquired something of Roman flavor. Lots of religions are influenced by climate, you know, and by their own uh, agricultural cycles, things like that. So that's how uh, the cult of Mithras became something entirely different than what Mithras originally might have been in these Middle and Far Eastern cultures, but still maintained some of that, that language, that flavor. And like I said, ultimately influenced to a large degree how Christianity developed. Christianity was largely in competition with you know, the cult of Mithras at the time and uh, left kind of a bitter mark on, on the cult while it was forced underground and eventually dissolved. But in Rome, it was limited to kings and soldiers. So it was a very kind of, uh, I believe they saw it as something of a, a masculine sort of rite, of rite of passage into what you might call masculine power, masculine, I wouldn't say mature masculinity, but definitely something of the power of masculinity, which I don't think really played a part in the Middle and Far Eastern traditions. But yeah, there, there's definitely a difference. Yeah, yeah. And you also mentioned the Christian connection there. And, you know, speaking of misinterpreted symbols and stories, let's touch more on that aspect. This is something that we've touched on before way back in episode 11, The Psychedelic Gospels. I don't know if you've heard of that book by Dr. Jerry Brown. But let's recap, and recap is a pun for those of us keeping score, but let's... <laughs> Let's recap the connection here between Christian symbols of Jesus and the crucifixion and how they relate to your thesis here, too. The Christian connection comes along in my research with a man named John Allegro, John M. Allegro, who is one of the one of the scholars who helped translate the Dead Sea Scrolls. So he was kind of a well-respected figure in his field until he dropped this bomb on the scholarly community that he believed the early Christianity was a mushroom cult and that a lot of what are seen as phallic symbols are in, in fact, fungal symbols and mushrooms. And, um, he provides a lot of linguistic explanations for what he's claiming. And not all of those, I think, stand up to uh, real scholarly scrutiny, but it still raised an in interesting question as to what was going on. Cause there, there are, Lots of points in the tale that I didn't discover myself in the, the Christian myth. But if you read, for example, um, Clark Heinrich's book, uh, Strange Fruit, which is now called um, Magic Mushrooms and Religion and Alchemy is the current title of the current edition. He discusses how at the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is praying and uh, the soldiers bust in and catch them, he describes this as history's first drug bust. <laughs> and specifically talks about how it's a long explanation because we have to talk about the way that Amanita muscaria is metabolized. It has a compound in it called ibotenic acid that is toxic, but upon the maturation of the specimen, proper drying, that ibotenic acid is converted into something called muscimol that's a hallucinogenic compound, and even more of it is converted upon digestion. And one of the things that makes Amanita muscaria unique is that after ingesting it and experiencing the drug, you can urinate the compound out and drink it again and have the same experience because it's not metabolized. The muscimol is and runs right through you. And actually drink eating it once and then drinking it after actually makes it even better because you've gotten rid of more of the ibotenic acid the second time around. And there was a you know, a lot of scoffing at this to disbelief until Clark took it upon himself to experiment and find out. Clark's the one who wrote the forward to my book, for those of you who don't know. And he and uh, the famous one of the fathers of the hippie movement, Bhagavan Das, who exposed uh, Richard Alpert, uh, Ram Das, to his guru when he was traveling through India. Uh, when he was back in the States, back to his original name, uh, his name was Michael Kermit Riggs. He's, he's still around, uh, but Michael Bhagavan Das and Clark Heinrich got together and, you know, spent a lot of time investigating this claim to see if it would work and uh, after working up to getting the mushroom to work the right specimen to not get sick they bit the bullet and drank the pee the second the second time and drank it and had a, just a phenomenal experience from that and so it was in his book where he really points out some of the more curious part of the Christian myth particularly the, the drinking of the living water and how Jesus says, you know, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking for living waters to drink, which Cork interpreted as being the, you know, the second flush of, of an enemy, enemy Muscaria trip. And there, there are numerous other, other points 
that would you know take a whole nother hour to really get into. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I will definitely go back and, and check out episode eleven because that's something I've, I'm personally profoundly interested in. I know there's a lot of claim of mushroom trees we examine in certain Christian art, and a lot of the trees do appear to be mushrooms. And uh, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, Dr. Brown, fabulous author named Tom Hatzis, who wrote The Witch's Ointment, mm-hmm. um, they're going to have a debate here. I, I don't know the date. Um, you'll have to look it up. But they're debating, you know, Hatzis and stances that these aren't mushroom trees, that it's just bad artists. But he and he and Brown are going to have a, a debate about what these trees really are. And are there any real examples of mushroom use in early Christianity? So that might be something to keep an eye out for and ear out for. I think it's going to be a probably a hell of a hell of a debate. Yeah, I've heard Tom Hatzis talk on many different podcasts, and uh, he's he's an interesting guy. I've heard Dr. Brown a few times too. Yeah, I mean, that, you're right. That would be worth tuning in for for sure. And I'm I'm glad mm-hmm. that you I'm glad that you mentioned the psychedelic urine. I was waiting this entire time to talk about that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah, absolutely. But back to the, uh, the Amanita muscaria just for a moment. That does have an alchemical connection too, right? Just in terms of the phases of its coloring. Right. And alchemy, you know, like I said, alchemy was a DIY process. So for one practicing alchemist, the, the right answer appears to have been a KCN BNT. For another alchemist, it appears to have been something different entirely. And from this school, there are certain schools of alchemy that certainly seem to point to Amanita muscaria. Color is a big factor in alchemical texts. The stone, to properly identify it, you have to know the colors at which it manifests. And the colors go from black to white to red. And, you know, these are called their own phases. Black is negredo, white is albedo, and red is rubedo. And there are other schools that switch red and white, so white will come last. But in this particular instance, again, this is Clark Heinrich, not, not me, argues that the, the Amanita muscaria, in its, while it's in the earth, is in the dark earth, that's the black phase, the negredo phase which Negredo is intimately connected with the idea of putrefaction, of rotting, and of course mushrooms are largely produced from decay. And then the next phase is the mushroom manifests as what looks like a white mass, like an egg. And from this egg is produced the mushroom proper, and the red, bright red peleus, the cap, emerges from the stipe, the stem. So Heinrich argues that this is definitely in line with the, the color phase, and he also makes some connections to uh, the phoenix, the mythical phoenix bird, which, you know, is said to be born in its nest. And, of course, where the mushroom grows, these mushrooms are mycorrhizal, so they only grow within the root systems of certain trees, um, notably pine trees. So when it grows from, you know, pine needle scattered ground, it produces the appearance of a nest, the way the pine needles arrange themselves around the specimen. And he says, you know, from this egg emerges the phoenix bird, this bright red bird that burns itself up and then burns itself to ashes. And from the ashes emerges a tiny worm that goes on to do it all over again. So when the mushroom emerges, like I said, it produces the image of of an egg in a nest. And the phoenix bird in the alchemical text, it always says that he's, he's fixed. He's attached to his nest. He can't fly away. He's stuck there. So in, in the text, it's, it's depicted by a phoenix in a nest with a chain around its foot. And um, from that egg emerges the bird. And the reason, you know, the bird imagery comes about is because when the peleus turns up a little bit, it exposes the lamellae underneath it, the gills. And that gives the appearance of outstretched wings, of feathers. And so this is the bird in flight trying to leave its nest. And anyone who's harvested mushrooms is aware of the fact that once they begin to decay, they are infested with maggots, with larvae. So whenever the mushroom finally dies, is gone, you still find maggots and larvae in the nest. And it says that they're produced from the ashes. And of course, when the mushrooms turn upturn their peleus and expose the lamellae, what they're doing is a process called sporulation. And this is when the spores fall from the gills. And it looks like nothing so much as ashes because it, the spores are white and there are just millions upon millions of them in the specimen. And as they fall, the space beneath them becomes white looking with ash. Uh, and it's from that that emerges that final worm. Uh, you know, so there's a color consistency. There's a allegorical consistency with the phoenix bird and with alchemy. So I definitely think he makes a great argument there. You even see uh, Michael Meyer, you know, when he described Hermes 
he's describing the phoenix bird and how to find it. And in the same text, he says, he just all of a sudden mentions Hermes out of nowhere and says that his, his sandals are black, that his body is white, and that his face is bright red. You know, and that's perfectly consistent with, with the uh, harvested specimen that has the, the bright peleus, the white stem, and then the bulbous, what's called the vulva at the base, which is when you harvest them, is still covered in that black, dank earth. Hey, going back to the idea of the egg, is that perhaps the cosmic egg that we hear so much about? It could, have, it could be a source for that myth. So much of mythology originates from natural symbolism, whether it's uh, astrological, agrarian, and in this case, you know, fungal. But yeah, I, I, it could be. And, you know, it also answers to, again, to the grail myth, which takes us back again to the Templars and Baphomet. The, the Holy Grail was said to manifest in three different ways. Um, the first way it manifested was as a round stone. Well, that's when it was first seen. The second time they saw it, it manifested as a flat table on a single leg. That's the open cat, right? And then the third mm -hmm. manifestation was as the grail itself, which is when the cat turns up and actually forms that cup appearance. And, of course, where was the Holy Grail found by the knights uh, in the forest? You know, exactly where you would expect to find an Amnita Muscari mushroom. Absolutely, man. And, you know, since we are near Christmas, I mean, there is uh, some Christmas symbolism here, right, too, with Santa Claus with his red and white outfit, and then our stockings over the chimney, which mimics the drying of the mushrooms. There's a, a paper that, that's going to come out for the holidays, written by a guy named Cody Narconi, who's one of the hosts of uh, Silly Rabbits podcast you might be familiar with. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he, he, he has a paper coming out just for the holidays. It kind of touches on Santa Claus and Krampus and the mushroom mystery and how it ties the two together. Uh, yeah, so the, it, it, that's, a, that's a fun topic that some people, you know, violently oppose. And then others are like, no, this is the sole solution. And, I'm, I'm somewhere in between, but I think it's, there's so many synchronicities, you might say, that it's, it definitely seems like more than just chance. I actually like that interpretation of, of Santa Claus. I, I, I think it's so much mm -hmm. fun to just entertain that idea that here we are in this very commercial consumer mindset with, with the way we celebrate the holidays when we could be celebrating with some dried psychedelic mushrooms instead of you know, stocking <laughs> stuffers. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody seen the, the picture of that traditional Siberian shaman? It's reproduced in several books. The, most notably, it's in uh, Plants of the Gods by uh, Hoffman and I can't remember his co-author, maybe it's Schultes. But that image of the, the traditional Siberian shaman holding the, the two emanita specimens and wearing the same outfit, you know, wearing the red with the white spots. And, you know, this idea of, of the priest making themselves consubstantial or, or one and the same thing with the object of sacrifice. And it looks like nothing so much as, like you said, like Santa Claus. It's definitely a fascinating conjecture. Yeah, man. I want to wrap up here on one more point, because I'd be remiss if we didn't mention Aleister Crowley before we go. Much like Baphomet and the other things that, that we've been talking about, you know, wholly misunderstood and misrepresented figure in occultism. Uh, you write a bit about how, for example, the bodily fluids of his sex magic rituals, you know, blood and semen, they may not actually be bodily fluids that he's referring to, or that the sex magic itself may not even be sexual. So set this record straight for us. What's up with Crowley and his sex magic, and what might he actually be talking about here? Well, first of all, there's no question that Crowley practiced and advocated sex magic. His diaries are filled with descriptions of of him with different women, prostitutes, practicing what he considered the, the high mystery of magic, which was basically involved ejaculating inside of a, a menstruating woman, it's taking the fluids out and consuming them, or applying them to talismans, or anointing different parts of the body, things like that. We, there's no question that he did that. But, you know, Crowley, he was a complex figure who, you know, anyone who's read his books knows that any sentence at any time could have one, two maybe three different meanings, not just interpretations, but depending on how you read it, he's saying three different things. And he, he discusses this uh, at one point where he says, how do you write for people of every level of initiation? You know, if, if it's a novice, you're writing in a language that the adept is completely tired of hearing. And if it's, you're writing to an adept, you're completely going to lose the novice. So how do you get one message to both of them? And, and it's still be valid. So, he had a way of writing on levels. And, you know, I had always just taken the, the sex magic thing at face value, the semen and 
menstrual blood symbolism, as not, not as symbolism, but at face value as a sacrament, as a magical entity in itself. Until, like I said, I spent some time with Mike Crowley, who is a, uh, uh, a llama of Kaju Vajrayana Buddhism. And he, in his book, I don't know if it's in the published version, it was in the, I, I read the unpublished manuscript while I was up there. And in the unpublished manuscript, he did discuss how in the Vajrayana tradition, these were used as mysteries, teaching mysteries, to point to the mushroom. And he said that the menstrual blood uh, represented the bright red pileus of the cap, and the semen would be splattered on top of the menstrual blood to give the appearance of white dot. And he said that this was a way to communicate the mushroom to those who weren't disgusted by the medium by which it was presented. So anybody who saw in that a dirty image, a dirty act, would immediately be turned away. But anybody who was prepared to investigate further and not be turned away by natural bodily fluids had the opportunity to arrive at the conclusion that a mushroom is what's dealt with. So this uh, immediately got me thinking about Crowley. And, you know, Crowley, he was a big a big user of various drugs for magic. He, uh, there's a, a, a couple of papers out there by Patrick Everett uh, where he discusses Crowley's use of peyote in his magical ceremonies. And Crowley himself has written extensively on the topic of, of hashish and the use of hashish in a magical context. So we know that he was also uh, one to use drugs. Well, in his Golden Dawn days, he inherited a text called 777. It's kind of, it's a Kabbalistic chart of sorts that breaks down the various, uh, what's called Sephiroth, on the Tree of Life, and their paths connect them together. And he breaks down their various correspondences in terms of deities that relate to them, minerals, metals, basically anything in religious, magical, and occult traditions. He kind of breaks down and says, well, we can explain this in terms of Kabbalah. One of those columns is called the vegetable drugs column. And in it, he places drugs to each of these sephiroth. So every drug that was known at the time is basically treated there. He, he deals with cocaine. He deals with opium, with hashish. He deals with deladonna, literally everything. And the only thing that's left out, you know, from what would have been known about what drugs would have been known at the time is Amanita muscaria. And to every single one of those rows on the column, he has a literal vegetable drug. It's called the vegetable drugs column, except to represent the highest one, which in Kabbalah, the highest sephir is called, is called keter or keter. It means crown. And the drug that he ascribes to that is elixir vitae, is all it says. The elixir of life is what that translates to. And, you know, most people who study Crowley would immediately say, well, the elixir vitae is sexual fluid. That's, you know, the, pretty much the crown of his system. But, you know, Crowley was a perfectionist, and sexual fluids are, are not vegetable. They're anything but vegetable. So we're immediately faced with a problem of, you know, why would a perfectionist such as Crowley haphazardly add something that's not a vegetable drug at the apex of this, this chart? So it opens the question, what was elixir vitae? And as we said with Clark Heinrich, he identified elixir vitae as amanita muscaria. He argues that very well, but this is the answer. And one book that I'm cert we're certain Crowley read, he never mentioned it, but it was a, a pretty big deal at the time, uh, was a book called The Seven Sisters of Sleep uh, that was published by, I can't remember his first name, something Cook, C-O-O-K-E. His first name is escaping me for some reason, but um, in it, it basically details all of the drugs that were known to the Victorian era and how, how and where they're used. And it does. It, as it purports, it names all of the main drugs. And one of those seven is Amanita muscaria. So, you know, for a classic vol Victorian volume like that, and for someone like Crowley, who was definitely into the use of drugs, for it to name Amanita muscaria and for Crowley to not is more suggestive than if he had named it in a veiled context. It makes it led me to suspect that maybe elixir vitae is that Amanita muscaria. And, you know, that was just a suspicion. All I really had to go on to back it up was a painting that appeared in the Equinox Volume 3 1, I think it is, the Blue Equinox, where he, he presents the picture of what he calls May Morn. And it's a picture of the scarlet woman hanging from a tree. And the tree is alive, has a face on it, and has a phallus sticking out where the phallus would be if the tree were a man, and it's an Amanita muscaria mushroom. So that's the only direct reference I could sign. Um, and I was running this by Chris Bennett, the cannabis scholar, and he said, well, that's it's really funny you mentioned that because I recently heard a podcast. It was an interview with 
Charles Stansfeld Jones's stepson. Well, Charles Stansfeld Jones is the famous Frederick Achad, who was, in their language, he was Crowley's magical child. He was a, his golden boy, his prime student. And after his days with Crowley, he had joined the army, moved back to Canada, and his stepson and this podcast, which you can find, it's still floating around online out there. He specifically says that when he wasn't in his room meditating and doing magical practices, that he would spend his free time behind their home in the wooded area looking for mushrooms. And this just was a phenomenal find for me because anybody who's looked into the history of Jones and Crowley has probably ran into Kenneth Grant's description of when Jones made it back to Vancouver. He showed up wearing nothing but a raincoat, took the raincoat off, and was totally naked and spent the next, you know, something like a half hour walking around the square speaking magical jargon and doing some kind of ritual in the nude in a total, almost psychotic state. And he was he was hospitalized following this. That, you know, is consistent with extreme mushroom intoxication. There's an episode described in Bhagavan Das's book, It's Here Now or You, where he describes a woman that ate too many mushrooms of the, of the fly agar variety and went into a similar, uh, just kind of ecstatic, psychotic, rage um, and had to go had to be hospitalized so like i said jones it appears knew about these mushrooms spent untold time in the wooded area behind his home looking for them why how does jones know about them if crowley didn't crowley being his prime teacher so yeah so from the sexual fluids and and bajra buddhism related to the mushroom to the elixir vitae reference to Crowley's never mentioning Amanita muscaria, right down to Jones's preoccupation with mushrooms and potentially uh, entheogenic psychotic break. It started to paint a whole different picture that maybe maybe there was a little bit more going on. I think the moral there is keep your mushroom doses to two or three grams or so. You mm-hmm. might wind up start start low. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. So hey, PD man, this has been fantastic. I've really enjoyed this chat. Uh, for people who are interested in picking up your book, All Chemically Stoned, or following you online, where can they find you? I have a, uh, a Facebook page, How Chemically Stoned by PD Newman, that kind of keeps up with my publications, my speaking date. Um, I speak all over the country, so if you want to come see me speak, and a lot of those are open, meaning I speak at lodges primarily, but if it's open, the public can come. So if you want to come see me speak or read my new articles, etc., that's the way to keep up with me. For the book, it's available through uh, my publisher, uh, The Laudable Pursuit, and it's also available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Yeah, it's easy to locate, and um, you know any, anybody who can't get it, just write me through Facebook, and I'll promptly get a copy out. I highly recommend it. I learned quite a bit of uh, new things from you, so I, I do appreciate you hanging out here for as long as you did. Thanks so it's much again. It's been a pleasure. Man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. This has been a great conversation. and Right, right. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And you've been a great host. You asked all the right questions. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Well, hey, thanks so much again, and uh, take care of yourself. Happy holidays, and I'll talk to you soon. Likewise. You have a great night. And there it be, a little bit of everything here. The Crystalline Philosopher's Stone, Skull Cup, Baptismal Rituals, Cosmic Eggs, Phoenix Birds, Sex Magic, and Trippin' Balls on Your Own Urine. Just another day at the Alchemical Office. But my thanks again to P.D. Newman. If you want to get even more Alchemically Stoned, hit the link in the show notes for his book. Quite the provocative theory, but one that I think makes a lot of sense. Plants and fungi are great friends and healers. And our ancestors, the ancients, the adepts, would have definitely experimented with anything they could get their hands on. I mean, they had to do something with their time. Instagram didn't exist, for fuck's sake. But it really doesn't take a psychedelic experience to realize the healing power of plants and fungi. I was actually just looking through my kitchen before I recorded this, and I was taking inventory for my next shopping trip. I want to I wanna read my list to you guys, because the shit that I'm buying now still amazes me. Uh, spirulina. Chlorella. Ashwagandha, astragalus, holy basil, turmeric, Siberian ginseng, reishi, chaga, lion's mane, cordyceps, nettle leaf, milk thistle, matcha, moringa, lemon balm, black pepper, parenthesis, the good kind. Quite a far cry from about three years ago when I was 50 pounds heavier, barely did any cooking, and was the first in line whenever Taco Bell rolled out a new pile of shit wrapped in a tortilla. Honestly, I wouldn't be talking to you right now if it wasn't for all our leafy and fungal friends helping me get my life back together. 
But don't take my word for it. Don't take PD's word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. Do your own research. Do your own experiments. Make your body your alchemical laboratory. Anyway, I got to get out of here before I get ergot. That's a pun, you know, based on this show here. Ergot. Uh, well, hey, support the show if you can. Gift yourself a t-shirt if you can. And until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.